There's an old hymn that I used to enjoy singing. It ended not somewhere else, but where thou art. I'm sure that many of us would be shocked if we knew how much of our lives is actually lived in the past in regret and nostalgia. Or on the other side of the fence where the grass is a little greener. Or in the future, in hopeful aspiration and fear and apprehension. Someone said that a picture is worth a thousand words. For instance, the story out of Zen tradition presents such a picture. It tells of a monk who was being chased by two tigers. He came to the edge of a cliff and frantically let himself down by a vine that was hanging there. After he'd climbed down a while, he looked up, up above him, at the very top, two mice were gnawing at the vine. Frantically looking down, he saw two more tigers awaiting him at the bottom, pacing back and forth, licking their chops. Just then he saw a beautiful strawberry growing within his arm's reach. He picked it, enjoyed the best strawberry he had ever tasted. <laughs> as typical as then. It's a parable of life. Wherever you are in time and space, be there. Live the moment and the experience completely. There may be regrets about the past, there may be apprehensions about the future, but what about today? What about the opportunity for joy and fulfillment in this moment, just where you are? One of the great discoveries, which is somewhat puzzling to many persons, is the truth that now is all the time there is. Now is all the time there is, this moment. You may have found the idea shocking. Because you may have looked at, have looked at the now, the present moment as the arena, in which to give vent to feelings about what you have been through, and make some kind of wise preparation for the days to come. Of course, this is not bad in itself. Unfortunately, the tendency to become preoccupied with anything and everything, except the here and now, can become obsessive. Many of us are obsessed in this very way and limit ourselves tremendously. For instance, it's pitiful to see a person figuratively is always walking backwards through life. It's in consciousness, of course. If you could draw a picture, a caricature of his life, you'd see that he was walking backwards, like uh, the old days when you rode an observation car on a train. You can see where you've been. You have the slightest idea where you're going. So the person can only appreciate people and circumstances and conditions in retrospect. This kind of person resists change. Living in the past, he dwells in the memories of people he once knew, things he once enjoyed, experiences that are long since consummated. Such persons are chained emotionally to regrets and remorse, to feelings of guilt, and to the memory of all the injustices they've ever done to him. It's sad, too, to see how the future dominates our thoughts. Not just in fear and dread of things to come, but in subtle ways such as I call the spiritual procrastination. We all have hopes and dreams that we want to have fulfilled in our lives, we have prayers that we would like to have answers to. There's a tendency, though, for, to think of them in terms of someday, at some future time they will come. Or the classic word that so often is used, in God's good time. I have news for you. God's good time is now. You need to accept it. Believe it. Let life happen to you this moment where you are. Time is the great illusion of life. Time is not a passing thing at all. We think of time as something that goes on tick by tick of the clock, minutes by minutes, hours by hours, day by days. It's not a passing thing. It's the whole of life's possibilities being progressively unfolded. Every atom carries within it the whole of the universe. It's a concept that comes out of new science that's hard for some to recognize. Every atom contains within the whole of the universe. Every idea carries within it the whole of divine mind. All of divine mind, all the infinite ideas of all time that have ever expressed and ever will express in the idea of your mind. 
Every fleeting instant is but a small parenthesis in eternity, as Thomas Brown says. The poet Blake spoke of seeing a world in a grain of sand, an eternity in an hour. This is the poet's attempt to deal with truth of the present and eternity are the same. The present and eternity are the same, one and the same thing. And the present, when we become conscious of the present and live in it, becomes the presence. You can't really understand the presence of God unless you understand the nowness of life. If we think of time as being a reality and that in some future time good things will happen and some time in the past great things will happen in my life, memories of the past are all that really counts, and you lose sight of the presence. You can't practice the presence, you practice the absence of God. The presence and eternity are the same thing. To live really for the moment is to live in eternity. Remember the fundamentalist Christian asked the question, sometimes it's printed on signs that you find along the highway or the mountain walls and so forth. Where will you spend eternity? Where will you spend eternity? You're spending it right now. You're in it. Of course, in consciousness, we get caught up in time, which leads to hurry and pressure and possessive anxiety. I get character in Alice in Wonderland. I'm late, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. We all know that feeling. To really live for the, for the moment, we must realize that while we live in time, we're not of it. We live in time, but we're not of time. We're spiritual beings, creatures of eternity. And the kingdom of God, the realm of the timeless, is within us. We need to work to shed the shackles of time and live for the moment every day of our lives. There's a sense that we're always on the vine. With who knows what gnawing at the vine above, or what lies in wait for us at the bottom. But the most important thing is there are delicious strawberries right where you are. You might say, but that's all well and good. But you have to face facts and be realistic. Life in our times is precarious at best and futile at worst. This is not realism. This is defeatism. Even if it is disguised under different names. A person who's caught up in the clutches of time can never enjoy life's possibilities. Because him, for him, there's no present. And there's no presence. He's aware only of the vine, the mice and the tigers. You can put your own identification of what those mice and tigers are, but we all have them. To live in the present is to live in the presence. To live sanely and gratefully. In the presence, which is to live in the kingdom of God. To live in that quiet place within where is security and wholeness. All these mice and tigers of life don't exist. Time becomes relative. It is possible, you see, to get out of time. Anytime you step off the whirlwind, the merry-go-round of time, and pause quietly in eternity, in the now, in the presence. You're free from concerns of the past and of the future. You're free to unfold the aspects of life progressively in consciousness, but outside of the limitations of passing time. So you can live sanely and gratefully. To repudiate the present is to live neurotically. Now is the time. There's no better time in all eternity, no more propitious time, no time in which we can live richer, more secure, more meaningful, in this moment where you are, right now. If you take time now to analyze your thoughts and feelings, you would probably find, if you're honest, much of your hopes for life are related to something that you hope will happen tomorrow, the next day, next week, when you grow up, when you get older, when you have your first car, when you get a job, when you get married, when you get divorced. <laughs> you look forward to how wonderful things will be when uh, you have that sungalow in Florida and you're retired. I was looking ahead, planning for something to come. There's no more propitious time, no more secure, more meaningful time in this very moment where you are, right here. So live in this moment now. Be here. Whether you're 9 or 90, 
an elementary or college postgraduate student. He's entering the marketplace over 30 years of business experience. He's not preparing for life, thinking that then I will be happy, then it will be good when that's done. It's fine to plan for these things and prepare for them and work for them, but keep yourself consciously centered in the kingdom within, in the nowness of life. Live now, live today. Never let yourself come to that time when you look back and say, gee, I had it good then, if I, only, I could only appreciate it. Live it now. Don't look back on it. And the place is here. The time is now and the place is here. One of the great desires in the human heart is to find your right place. Many of us spend years of our life looking for that right place, that right job, that right relationship. You want to be where you are, where you're wanted and loved. You want to find continual work that's fulfilling and prospering. You want to feel that in this great universe, your life counts for something. We all hunger for that. Because we live so much of our lives at the circumference of being, we long for a change, something better, the opportunity, the break, the good luck that may bring us the right job and put us in the right niche. We're looking out there for something that must originate within ourselves. You can't come anywhere else. It can only come through you. Often in desperation, we ask, what's life all about anyway? The interesting thing is, we ask that question when life is at its lowest ebb, when we have some shock, some difficulty. What's it all about anyway? We really want to know. It should lead to the realization that life is not just minding your own business, drifting along like a tumbling tumbleweed, moving along and make the best of things that happen. Life is for living, for growing, for unfolding our greater potential. And you live now. You can't live tomorrow. You live now. Tomorrow is a fleeting fantasy. You can't live yesterday. It's gone. You live now. Now is the only time. There's a suggestion of the common feeling of futility and meaninglessness that so many of these persons have in the play Mornings at Seven, where a white-haired white dentist, Carl, periodically suffers from what the family politely calls his spells. When the spells come on, he goes about frantically asking everyone, where am I? Where am I? He's not referring to a geographical location. What troubles Carl was, where am I after 60 years of living? What have I accomplished? Where am I spiritually, mentally, emotionally, morally? He was haunted by the feeling that he had been through, been going nowhere through the years. You know, he owned his home, had a comfortable living. Where was he? I'm telling many persons feel this haunted feeling. Unfortunately, the hallmark of the modern way of life is the worship of material success, the easy road, peace of mind, early retirement. Students of truth have also equated spiritual growth with the demonstration of things, which is a completely unrealistic attitude toward life. People spend years of their life jumping from job to job, moving from place to place, going from one love relationship to another, Always looking for the right place, the right person, the right compensation in life. Never finding it, of course. Because you only find it in the now. Not, I find it if I can get away from this place, if I get the right person. But now is the time, right where you are. No matter where you are, you are still what you are. No matter where you are, you are still what you are. Running away will not change that. Emerson wisely says, running away is a fool's paradise. He says, I pack my bags and set sail for a distant port, only to disembark and find the same stern unrelenting me that I fled from. We say, but I can't stand this place, this job, this relationship. If I could just get away from where I am, how different my life would be. But no matter where you go, you'll be there too. E. Stanley Jones tells of wandering through the ruins of ancient Babylon, which is really what is now Iraq. Picked up a little flower. The only living thing that was in this vast wasteland. As he looked at its lovely delicacy, he said, Why is it, little flower, 
that you, so frail that I could crush you between my fingers, have survived. This vast empire, founded on military might, has perished. And the flower, he said, seemed to smile back at him and say, I obeyed the laws of God written in myself, so I lived. Discover the laws of God written in yourself and live. You'll prosper and be happy and contented, but it will be right where you are. Not something that may happen around the bend of the road, off in the future, out where the blues begin, in the happy hunting grounds, some future eternity, right where you are. Jesus said, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all persons unto me. I, if I be lifted up, will draw all persons unto me. This was not a statement of some special power of his. It was a statement of divine law. If you were lifted up in consciousness, the pattern of your world would automatically change. You find the right consciousness of your oneness with God. You draw to you all the right combinations, friends, loved ones, opportunities, jobs, money, environment of peace. But until you lift your thoughts to a higher realization and find this inner place in the kingdom within you, you simply be running away from yourself, like reaching for the brass ring on a merry-go-round. If you catch the brass ring, you simply get another ride. It goes on and on. They say often, it's not just getting there, it's earning the right to be there. Not just getting there, but earning the right to be there. You earn that right by the attitudes you develop right where you now are. Wherever you are now, no matter how challenging it is, you can be an opportunity through which you can grow and go on to success if you meet in the right manner. And it is important to know that the reason you're in that place, that job, that relationship, that condition, that you've attracted an experience of growth that is precisely the growth experience that you need at this time. To run away from it is to miss life's greatest opportunity for you. And there's no way to get away from it. This doesn't mean that you must have problems, but it does mean that when confronted by a particular difficulty, you should admit to yourself that it indicates a need for growth. Instead of complaining, why do I have to go through this? Even I refuse to go through this, I need to ask, but how can I grow through this? That's where life is found. And as I say so often, looking at the passing of time on the eternal cycle, you will go through and go through and go through and go through a problem until eventually you grow through it. And that go through and go through goes beyond the end of life and other lives, the continuity of experience in eternity. You go through it until you grow through it. So the best attitude is when you find yourself in the midst of some challenging thing that you would all, for all the world like to drop in like a hot potato and run off, stand still. Decide you'll go through this until you grow through it. When you grow through it, you're done with it. You may ask, but how long do I have to keep picking myself up out of the gutter? In other contexts, Jesus said, until 70 times 7. Life is a constant process of getting up. That's what Homo sapiens is all about. An Oriental saying it says, it's not just falling in the ditch, it's lying there. When a pilot earns his wings, he doesn't graduate from flying. He now begins to fly all the time. That's what his life is about. You see the story of the Israelites in their 40 year search in the wilderness for their promised land, their rightful place. In a personally symbolic way, Moses is the coming of truth into our consciousness. When we get our first glimpse of truth, we follow the gleam toward our land of promise. It seemed to be a simple thing to change our thought from insufficiency to confidence. It would seem easy for the Israelites to cover the 200 miles to Palestine. Actually, they did arrive at the Palestinian border after a short journey. Spies were sent out on a reconnaissance. They returned to report, there are giants in the land and we are in their sight as in ours, grasshoppers. So when they had left their Egyptian bondage, they were still slaves at heart. It was all there for the taking. They didn't have the conscience to enter in and possess the land. It was not getting there. It was earning the right to be there. This is a confusing point to many students. You may say, but well, I've been inspired by this new insight. I really want to change my way of life through the use of truth. Why am I not healed? Why do I not receive prosperity, a better job, a good relationship? The Israelites, in their wilderness story, provides the answer. 
It would appear that in their years of frustration, God was punishing them. God never punishes us for our mistakes. We punish ourselves through the mistakes, always. Actually, from the, from the perspective of Jewish history, the 40-year period of wandering in the wilderness was the single most productive period in their history. They left Egypt with no skills, no meaningful religion, no national pride. They had to wander in their wilderness schoolroom until they became a community and developed their own culture. It was a long, hard way, but it was the only way for them. We need to know this about ourselves. If they'd gone right into the land, they would have been destroyed as a people. For them, the shortest distance between two points was not a straight line. They took the long way, and along that way, they dropped the dress of their conscience and claimed their spiritual inheritance. But you see, they were children of God, even in, in slavery in Egypt. They just didn't know it. You're a child of God in the midst of the greatest bondage of your life. You're a child of God within sickness, within unemployment, in chaos in your life. The difference is you don't know it. Jesus knew it. Anyone who's ever demonstrated the truth has known it, even if for just a moment. The need is to know that you, your desire to get there can only be fulfilled when you earn the right to be there in consciousness. There's a fundamental Christian tradition that has been greatly confused. The second coming of the Christ. The fundamentalist Christians talk about this often. Many folks have fantasized that they've seen Christ come the second time in their lives. It may be true. Christians have been told that they expect Jesus to come again in the flesh. Whether or not this happens is irrelevant. It's to miss the whole idea of his mission. In the first place, Jesus' life was personally symbolic as well as historical. Like Moses, Jesus represents the coming of truth to consciousness. But beautiful as it all may appear, there's still something coming through you. Only that which comes through you can really change you. Life is normally a process of coming to you. Only what comes through you can change you. Somewhere along the line, there must be a personal revelation. This is the second coming. As simple as, aha, now I see. The first coming was when truth seemed like a good thing. It's a great idea, beautiful philosophy. You read the books, you filled your mind with all sorts of affirmations. You treated, you prayed. Sometimes after a week or a year or several years or lifetimes of work, suddenly, aha, now I see. That's the second coming. How long will it take? Time is relative. The important thing is, in getting from where you are to where you want to be, the growth process is vitally ongoing, no matter how long it takes. Not just so you can make the demonstration. It was the need for that growth that prompted your desire the demonstration in the first place. And you become the effective person in the position that ultimately comes to you, not in spite of the fact that, that you had to come the long way, but because of it. Because of it. The difficulty that seems so terrible to you, so tragic, so unbearable, you have to get away from it. It's the very place where your divine appointment has given you the opportunity to grow, the very growth that is your conscious desiring to experience right now, where you are. So your right place is the place where you are at this moment, whether it is pleasing or not. You're always in your right place. That may be hard to accept. You look at your life right now, see the difficulties, the confusions, the lovelessness, the insecurity, the financial difficulty, the unemployment, the sickness, the friendliness, friendly, unfriendliness friendly, shown to you. Now is the place. Now is the time. Because you're always in the place that corresponds to your mentality at that moment. The inner experiencing the outer. The place in conscious, indicating where you are right now. If you can accept that and affirm, I'm in my right place now. It's a matter of admitting to yourself that you participate in this. There's no unrelated experiences in life, unrelated to your consciousness. Not that you cause everything to happen, but you participate in everything that happens. You're a part of it. If you accept that, then you can get the idea, I'm in my right place now, the place to go. I put my thoughts upon the future, upon the things that I want to happen. I can't accept the present as anything but an aberration, a block in my way of getting the things I want. But the things that are present in your life now are the stepping stones on which you can achieve the consciousness. 
enabled you to get into the flow of the experiences that you hunger for. I'm in my right place now. It can be a place of growth. Change your mentality. The outer conditions will change, too. It's the fundamental truth. But you don't have to run away or frantically seek to escape. If you make the inner changes, either the problem will eventually disappear, or things will conspire to move you in an orderly way in the right and perfect time. When you've proven yourself, taking hold of your experience and beginning to change one step at a time. It's important to get the right attitude about the place where you are. As long as you resent a job, or people, or environment, or the town in which you live, you will, in effect, bind yourself to that place, to that level of consciousness, to those experiences, from the standpoint that you'll keep running into these things time and time again everywhere you go. You may run away from a job because you can't stand the employer. You may run away from a relationship because you can't get along with the person. Unless you face up to the fact that you were brought into that experience by your consciousness, running away from it is simply to postpone it. Wherever you go, whatever the city, whatever the relationship, whatever the job, whatever the company you work for, whatever the friends, you invariably still find looming up before you a boss named Sam, who is just the same as a boss named Joe. A spouse named Mary or Frank, just the same as the spouse named Henry and Lila. You meet these things over and over again. That's consciousness. Jacob said, we don't let thee go, except thou bless me. Life says to you, you can never take the next logical step in your unfoldment. Do you bless and loose everyone and everything in your present experience? It's often true that you've not realized your inner potential, because you're not seeing rightly. You're not seeing your true relationship to the world in which you live. Your job and relationships and environment seem to be all wrong. You long to find your right place. All you need to do is find yourself and begin to see things differently. I invite you to be still for just a moment. I want to take these words into our consciousness. And when you go from this place today, perhaps you will have forgotten all the thoughts that we've suggested. Maybe you just remember, not the words, but the energy, the flow of this treatment. You are now established in the consciousness of the presence of God, which is present. God is where you are. Good is where you are. The perfect activity of God is where you are, activating the good in every circumstance. The activity of God acts creatively in every person, place, and thing, in all time and space. God's creation is orderly. Everything and everyone is a right and perfect place. Everything and everyone moves in perfect precision in their rightful place, perfectly performing their rightful function. There is, therefore, a perfect place for you. All the forces of the universe move to put you in that place. This right place is not a static condition. It's a dynamic flow of experiences. So you do not resist change or fear that someone may take your place from you. You're in your right place now. If that place is not harmonious, then you now perceive the inner patterns that cause the unharmony. You set about to alter those patterns. As light follows darkness, the problems of your present place disappear. Are you irresistibly drawn to better conditions? In the Father's house are many mansions, said Jesus. There's a right and perfect place for you in time and space. You accept it now. You're in your right place, right here, this moment. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So be it. I invite you to join us. As you know, for during the months of this year and continuing through the year, we're involved in a project that we call the Circle of Light. 
It was born in a realization that uh, all of us involved in the truth potentially have something very great to give to the world, and we should be busy giving it. Sometimes we get too involved in ourselves and forget that the light that is needed out there in the world must come through us, not just to us. We must be a part of it. We're taking the time every Sunday here to getting a sense of the circle of light. You know, the lights around the perimeter here, and you think of them as going all around the room, almost like a tiara. This light is that which comes through enlightenment, through knowledge of the truth, through awareness, through a feeling of oneness with the infinite process. As we unite in consciousness, or swarm, as the birds swarm and swarms of fish in the sea, swarming with a divine intelligence that leads us all into one unit, one broad force, we let this light shine. It goes out into the world to bless the world. I am the light of the world, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine. Let's get still in that consciousness. Let's see, as I have seen the vision here at the Avery Fisher Hall, as a radiance of light that goes out to the world. Let's envision this light reaching out to all the world to bring blessings to the hungering, insecure, war torn lands, places of insecurity and in harmony everywhere, and the needs in our country for prosperity, for security, for the radiance of goodness and love. We stand united here in this moment, and light goes forth from here in all directions to bless all persons. We give way to this light. We give way freely, lovingly, in our desire to be a part of the solution to the world's problems, not just be a part of the problems. We let our light shine. And the light set on the hill cannot be hid. The light experienced in a high state of consciousness becomes a steady beacon, spreading the word good news of truth everywhere. Let's be aware of that during all the week. So be it. <laughs> <laughs>